Well, hello everyone. How are you this afternoon, morning, or evening, depending on where you're joining us? Uh, welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today we're very pleased to bring you this month's installment of E4C's Off-Grid Energy Webinar Series, focusing on the design of off-grid systems, in particular on load and resourcing. My name is Yana Aranda, and I'm the president here at Engineering for Change, and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. The webinar you're participating in today will be archived on our webinars page and E4C's YouTube channel. Both URLs for those channels are listed on this slide. Information on upcoming webinars is available on our webinars page. E4C members will receive invitations to upcoming webinars directly. If you have any questions, comments, and recommendations for future topics and speakers, please feel free to contact the E4C webinar series team at webinars at engineeringforchange.org. If you're following us on Twitter today, I'd like to invite you to join us in conversation with our dedicated hashtag, hashtag E4C webinars. Now, before we move on to our presenter, I'd like to tell you a bit about Engineering for Change. E4C is a knowledge organization and a global community of more than 1 million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and social scientists who are leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities. Some of those challenges include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy solutions, improved agriculture, and more. We invite you to become a member. E4C membership is free and provides access to news and thought leadership, insights on hundreds of essential technologies in our solutions library, professional development resources, and current opportunities such as jobs, funding calls, fellowships, and more. E4C members also enjoy a unique user experience based on their site behavior and engagement. Essentially, the more you interact with the E4C site, the better we will be able to serve you resources aligned to your interests. For more, please see our website and sign up. Today's webinar is the almost the last, nearly last one in the Offered Energy webinar series. Additional topics covered in the series are drawn from the book titled Battery Fundamentals for Off-Grid Electrification, authored by our presenter, Dr. Henry Louis. The final webinar in the series is uh, actually coming up next month, and the previous webinars are all listed on this slide. Um, we encourage you to check out those recordings if you didn't have a chance to participate in the previous webinars. And for those of you who are looking forward to part two of uh, the design of off-grid systems, uh, that you'll receive uh, information directly in your mailbox if you're an E4C member, or you can go ahead and click on the link to register on the site. For reference, you can find examples of off-grid energy products like the Mobisol Solar Home System in the E4C Solutions Library. There you can learn about technical performance, compliance with standards, academic research, and user provision models of these systems. All the information is sourced by E4C's research fellows and reviewed by our community of experts. Um, and the Solutions Library is available to E4C members free of charge, so definitely check it out. Now, a few housekeeping items before we get started. We'd love to practice using WebEx with you. Um, and the first way to do this is to tell us where you are in the world. So in the chat window, which is located at the bottom right of your screen, please type your location. If the chat is not open on your screen, try clicking the chat icon at the bottom of the screen in the middle of the slide. You can use this window to share your marks during the webinar, and if you have a technical question, just send a private ch a chat to uh, the Engineering for Change admin. And I'll also add my own answer here. Um, I see some of you are answering in the Q&A, so uh, I do encourage you to please use uh, the chat window as uh, we are dedicating the Q&A window for other things. But I do welcome you. It's great to see folks from Nashville, from Milwaukee, uh, from Ohio, from Germany, from the UAE, um, from Morocco. We are really thrilled to have you here. Now, uh, during the webinar, we'd like you to use the Q&A window, which is located below the chat, to type in your questions for the presenter. 
Again, if you don't see it, click the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen in the middle of the slides. Um, so please note we will aim to stop today's webinar 15 minutes before the hour or at 1145 Eastern Standard. But we'll make sure to set aside enough time for Q&A. If you li are listening to the audio broadcast and you encounter any trouble, try hitting stop and then start. You may also want to try opening up WebEx in a different browser. All right, so I see more folks have uh, answered here. We have uh, participants from Denver, from Savannah, from the Philippines. Welcome one and all. We are really thrilled to have you and I'm glad everybody is getting a hang of the difference here between the Q&A and the chat. Um, there we go. And you should be also seeing those answers for those of you who are now accessing the chat from all of our wonderful participants around the world. So E4C webinars qualify engineers for one professional development hour. To request your PDH, please follow the instructions on the top of the E4C professional development page after the presentation, or you can also go to your member dashboard to get that directly. You will also have a record there of all the webinars that you've attended to date. Well, fantastic. Um, now I'd like to take a moment to introduce our presenter. Uh, Dr. Henry Louis is an associate professor um, and Fort Francis Wood Endowed uh, Research Chair in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Seattle University. His research areas include electricity access in developing communities, renewable energy, and appropriate technology. He's the president and co-founder of Kilowatts for Humanity, a nonprofit organization providing electricity access and business opportunities in sub-Saharan Africa. Dr. Louis served as a Fulbright Scholar to Cooper Belt University in Kitwe, Zambia. He is recognized as a distinguished lecturer of the IEEE and as an associate editor of the Journal of Energy for Sustainable Development. He's the author of the book that he'll be speaking about today, uh, which is published by Springer Nature, and we are very thrilled to have him um, leading our webinar series. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Louis. Take us away. All right. Thank you. And let me just uh, make sure that I can advance the slides on my end. Uh, did you see that advance? Hey, Anna, does not that work? yet. Not yet. Mm -hmm. So let me see if I can. Pass me the ball. Uh, give me one second. Yep. We're doing it right now. There you go. Let's try it again. All right. How about that? Bingo. All Perfect. right. Thank you. So, Thank you so much. It's, it's great to be back here for my fifth webinar with Engineering for Change. And today we're going to talk about off-grid system design. And this is going to be uh, the first part in a two-part webinar series. The next one is going to be on March 6th. So today we're going to talk about load and resource estimation. And the reason why we care about estimating the load and energy resources of a, a potential site for an off-grid system is that these two pieces of information are critical to the input to our design process. So if we want to get our system appropriately designed, we really need to know the load as well as the energy resource potential. So like the other webinars, today's webinar is based off uh, the book that I wrote called Off-Grid Electrical Systems in Developing Countries. It's a textbook designed for uh, engineering uh, students and practitioners. And you can access it through a number of ways uh, through my website. It's available on Amazon and also through the publisher uh, Springer. And today's webinar is going to follow chapter 11, uh, which is load and resource estimation. And if you want additional um, uh, details or, or problem sets, examples, and so forth, uh, you should check out the book and, uh, and follow along in chapter 11. So today what we're going to cover is how we characterize the consumption, the electrical consumption of off-grid users. And we're going to focus primarily on the mini-grid um, solution to, to rural electricity access. We're also going to describe approaches to estimating load and the energy potential of different types of, of power sources like wind, solar, hydro, and, and uh, so on. So let me just provide a brief overview of the design process for off-grid systems. We begin with a few inputs, and most important are the inputs, are the estimations of the load and the energy resource. These then feed into one of several design approaches that we might take might take, which we'll discuss in next month's webinar. And the output then is going to be the ratings and specifications of the major components like batteries and inverters and uh, other components, uh, depending on the, the type of off-grid system that we choose. 
So today we're really gonna focus then on the inputs to the design process. Now, when we design an off-grid system, what we're trying to do is we're gonna to try to manage the trade-off between reliability and cost. So we can design a system that is really, really reliable, but unfortunately it's gonna be really expensive. And I think the engineer and many, many of us like to think, well, that's not bad to have a reliable system. But we maybe spent more money on that system than we needed to. And instead of impacting one community, maybe we could have impacted two or three for the same cost. On the other hand, if we, if we drive towards extreme affordability, then perhaps the system doesn't meet the needs of our users and it's not reliable. The key to striking this balance is to manage the input energy and the output energy and trying to make sure that we have enough input energy to, to match the load and of course, whatever losses might have. So today we're gonna focus on, um, on the output energy to start with and then we'll get into the input energy at the end of the webinar. So let's imagine that we are trying to serve a small community with an off-grid system, so a mini-grid, for example. We have to ask ourselves, what characteristics of that load do we need to know in order to design the system? And I think first, we need to know how much load. And we conceptualize the load in two ways. One is the energy required, and we usually think of that as the daily energy, as well as the peak, because several of our components in our system need to be designed around that peak power consumption. So let's first talk about the average daily load. So the average daily load is important uh, because this is typically what we uh, base our financial models on in off-grid systems. So average daily load, we're talking about energy and uh, energy is, is what we bill our customers on. So it's important to find customers then that have a, a lot of consumption, um, otherwise our grid won't be um, economically viable. Now we found in, in research that the, con the average daily load really depends on the customer type. So a industrial user is gonna use more than a commercial user and a commercial user is gonna use more than a household. But there's a lot of variation within those, those classes. And overall what we found is that there's this long tail, this distribution of, of con average daily consumption has a long tail, meaning that some users are going to use a lot, but most users are gonna use very little. Most users might use somewhere between 20 or maybe 30 watt hours a day. And it's really, really hard to recover your costs at that low consumption. So the table on the right is just an example of how this might play out for a, a system connected to a mixture of households and, and um, businesses. So you can see that a small fraction, less than 1%, 0.5% of, of the users uh, are gonna consume about as much energy as 75% of the users, those, those low consuming households. And so it's critical to find the users that are gonna have high consumption. These are, are, are the users that are really gonna make your grid economically viable. Uh, in a way, they're subsidizing all those other users with low consumption. So if you're designing a grid, you should be prepared for that. Most most uh, practitioners now are, are adopting the approach where they're looking for, for what they call anchor loads. So usually these are businesses or industrial facilities that they know are going to use a lot of energy. And, and once they've identified and agreed to connect these users, they then um, will branch out and connect uh, other houses who may or may not consume uh, a lot of energy. Now we talked about the peak load being important. And so the peak is just that maximum power that we expect any given user to use. And this is again important because when we uh, design our inverter and, and generators and so forth, we need to know the peak value to, to plan around. Now we also might, we also will need to know when that, that energy is consumed and, and when the peak is in order to serve our, our uh, customers. And so one way of expressing the timing of the consumption is through something called the load profile. So the load profile is nothing more than the average consumption across, uh, across a day. And uh, from this, you can get an idea of the trends in consumption. And the timing is actually really important, uh, especially for systems that might rely on, on um, solar or wind, because we really want the consumption to, to match or, or be coincident with that uh, energy production. So unfortunately, most households that uh, connect to mini grids 
their consumption peaks at night. They use very little during the day, and it's only after the sunset that they start turning on lights and turning on their television. So obviously this doesn't correlate with, with uh, solar production, which means we have to use larger batteries. Now on the screen you see load profiles from several, several different types of customers, uh, and you can see that they can be quite different. So like I said before, households tend to peak at night. Uh, some entertainment centers like a video hall, they might also peak a after um, the sun sets. But restaurants and hair salons, they might peak at, at different types or excuse me, different times of the day. Now that peak is actually quite important. And in power engineering communities, we, we describe the peak often as the load factor. So the load factor gives you an idea as to how peaked the uh, load profile is. And the load, pro, or excuse me, the load factor is simply the ratio of the average power uh, to, to the, peak, uh, the peak load. And so up at the top, you see an example of a, of a user with a low load factor. And you can see it's got a sharp peak. And we don't like uh, customers with low load factors because what it means is we have to, we have to build our system to, to supply that peak. And for example, the inverter will need to be sized to provide that peak. But overall, uh, that inverter's capacity is really underused for most hours of the day. So maybe 20 or, or more hours a day, it's really really not uh, being used too much, and it's only an hour or two a day where, or it's anywhere close to its maximum. At the bottom, we have a, a profile with a high load factor. And so here, it's much less peak. We, we still have a peak, but it's much, much lower. And so we can provide this customer uh, a, a lower power uh, service and, and still provide them the same energy uh, over the course of the day. Now, we're also interested not only in, in what the load is on, on any given day, but how it might vary over time on both short scales, short time scales, and longer time scales. And I'll tell you why this is important. Here are two users, user A and user B, with the same average consumption. Uh, user A is actually going to be easier to supply in terms of reliability than user B. And, and the reason why is that users, user A's um, daily usage is much more consistent than that of user B. And really, reliability isn't so much dictated by the average. It's dictated by the extreme events. Perhaps the, uh, the user has uh, a few days a year where they consume two or three times the amount of their average. Those are the days where you're worried about from a reliability standpoint. So we need to understand not only the average, but the distribution, the probability that they're going to be using two or three times or even more than their average in order to, to have a good understanding of what the reliability requirements of our system uh, of our system is. In addition to the day-to-day -day variation, we need to know what the long-term growth might be. Now, it's commonly reported for many off-grid systems that we'll see a, a growth of maybe between five or 10% a year, uh, but this is definitely not guaranteed and it's not consistent amongst customers, and it's not consistent across all uh, mini grids. Uh, but there usually is some growth that will occur, and in your design, you should anticipate it to the best of your ability. Now, typically, growth is a good thing, and we want to encourage demand uh, uh, for our electricity. But a barrier that exists is access to higher power appliances. It, it might just be, uh, uh, untenable for our, our users to, to purchase a, a refrigerator or, or another television set because they don't have access to credit or financing. So many uh, off-grid system implementers, what they do is they have, to, they have to have some sort of program that makes access to the, these appliances easier. They might offer subsidies, they might offer financing, they might lease appliances, but you really do need to stimulate that growth after a certain level in order to, uh, to make it happen. And then I think the last characteristic that's important to understand to, to design our system is how, how the load um, is related between one user and the next, how coincident they are or how correlated they are. And let me show you why this is important. Let's say that we have an estimate of each of these users' 
peak load, so the maximum power that they're going to do. And it's shown on the screen now. When we design our system, we need to know the aggregate peak. And so one approach to this would be to simply sum the individual peaks. And if we did that in this scenario, we'd end up with a peak of 1,000 watts. So do we need to design our system to supply a peak of 1,000 watts? Well, naively, you'd say, yes, we do, because that's, that's sort of the worst case scenario. But in practice, what are the chances that all of those users are going to be consuming their peak load at the same moment? And, and most likely, they won't be. And so there's a way of, uh, we do this in power engineering all the time in, in the United States and, and Europe and other places, is we don't design around that worst case scenario. If everybody in your neighborhood turned on every appliance all at the same time, the power grid would come crashing to its knees. It's not designed to do that. In other words, it expects there to be some diversity in consumption. And the way we express this is something called a co by something called a coincidence factor or a diversity factor. And it, it's basically a number that shows um, how, how uh, coincident the, the load is. And we generally want lower values of coincidence because it means that the peaks aren't occurring at the same time. So to give you a graphical example of what this looks like, here are those same five homes uh, with, with their peak, uh, peak load shown and their load profile now. And if we add them all up, we get the load profile shown on the right. Now, it still has a peak, but the peak is 780 watts. It's not 1,000. So if we were to design around the 1,000-watt um, requirement, we will have uh, resulted in an overbuilt system, and perhaps we wasted money. So, of course, every scenario is going to be different. Uh, but the goal here is to, to connect diverse customers, customers who, whose peaks are going to be different, whose usage patterns, patterns are different. And in doing so, the aggregate peak is going to decrease. The load factor is going to increase. It's going to be less peaked than if they were all uh, correlated. And then the day-to-day -day variation is also going to be lower. Because what we're going to find is that when one user, maybe they have some family over and they're their television and lights are on more often, there'll be another user connected to our grid, and maybe they've gone out of town, and so their consumption drops to, to zero. So the more users we connect, really the better. The more diverse users we connect, uh, the better. So to summarize this, what we're looking for then is users with high average daily consumption. Uh, after all, that's what's going to pay our bills as a mini grid operator. We want their load profile to be coincident with production. This is especially important in systems like wind or solar, where, where we might have a, a peak of production during the day or some other time. We want our load to really match up with that. We want a load factor near one, which means it's not peak. That lets us have smaller rated inverters and generators and other equipment. We want the variation from one day to the next to be as low as possible because it's the extreme events that, that uh, threaten our reliability. We want there to be long-term growth, but we want it to be predictable. And we want a low coincidence factor. So those are the characteristics that we're looking for. Ah, but how do we know if a customer is going to have these characteristics? Well, it's tricky. And as an industry, we don't have a great way of doing it. Uh, but there are some approaches that are better than others. And so I'm gonna go over the state of the art here. There's really four approaches that are being used, uh, which I'll talk about next. The first approach is what we call a bottom-up approach. And this is only really applicable if you have good knowledge of the equipment that is uh, going to be connected in, in a, uh, a given house or a school or something. So you have an idea of the appliances, and you know exactly how they're going to be used, and at which case you just do uh, the simple math of taking the power rating of each appliance, multiplying it by the time it's going to be used, and uh, multiplying it by what's called a loading percentage, which accounts for the fact that not all appliances consume the rated power when plugged in. Uh, and you end up with the value of the, the energy use uh, per day. So this is just an example of that calculation. So if you knew that there were going to be five lights, each rated at 11 watts, used for four hours a day, and because lights use the same amount of power uh, when they're turned on consistently, the loading percentage is just uh, 100 you get an average uh, daily use of energy of 220 watt hours. Um, if you knew that it was going to be a refrigerator connected, you would repeat the process. The loading percent is probably going to be uh, less than 100. It's going to be maybe closer to 10 because the compressor is likely not running 24 hours a day. And you'd get a 480 watt hour total. 
So this user then would, would have a total consumption of about 700 watt hours. Uh, so this is the, what's called the bottom-up approach, and the big drawback to that is in most cases, you're not going to know exactly what appliances are going to be used and how long they're going to be used for each day. It just won't happen uh, unless it's a special scenario like a, like a school where you only know that they're going to be using lighting um, and, and you're not providing other outlets or things to be plugged in. So how do we improve upon or, or how do we uh, extend the bottom-up estimation to the more general case? Well, most of the time we would use surveys then. So these are usually door-to-door -door surveys, and they'll ask a number of questions. And, uh, but really, it boils down to two pieces of information. You know, when the grid gets here, when we uh, build our mini grid, what appliances do you expect to own, and how long will you use them for? And based upon that information, then we can develop a, uh, an estimate of the average daily energy. If we word our, word our uh, surveys, uh, cleverly, then we can come up with an idea of the, the peak consumption and the load profile and some of the variations that we might need to, uh, to better design our system. Now, as uh, bulletproof as this might seem, it's actually uh, very error prone. Um, research has shown that you know, we can expect errors in excess of 300%. Uh, most of the time, people will overestimate their consumption, but there are certainly times where people will underestimate it. And it's easy to see why. I mean, uh, most of these people that you're going to connect, maybe they've never owned an appliance in their life. And, and, and so they're speculating on what they're going to use and when they're going to acquire those appliances. They don't know how they're going to use it. And in particular, if they're paying for the energy, they might not have a good idea of, of what they can afford. And then there's also on it from a technology standpoint, you know, if you look at the power rating of an appliance, it's not constant and, and um, the actual consumption is going to vary. So it's hard to do. And then finally, surveyor bias. It's incredibly difficult to design a survey and implement a survey that doesn't introduce some bias. Um, even if you, you know, it's done in the local language and um, you follow the best practices, you're going to have some bias in there. And some people might, might bias it towards overconsumption um, because they think if they tell you that they're going to use a lot of energy, that you're more likely to install the mini grid and more likely to connect them. On the other hand, if they, some, some people might try to underestimate their, um, their consumption, thinking that somehow this is going to affect the rate uh, that they have to pay. So if, if they, they feel that if they can convince you that their consumption is low, that they're going to pay very little. So there's a lot of bias. Uh, all over the place in doing these surveys. So if you want to get away from the bias, there's a few other uh, approaches that you can take. Uh, one is to try to do a regression analysis where you look at maybe census data or demographic data and you try to correlate it to the consumption. So there's been a number of, um, of variables that people have tried to relate to consumption and, um, and this is a method that works in some, some areas, but um, I, I don't think I've seen a, a one that's been universally applied with high success. So I'll direct you to references four and five uh, for more information on those. Now the approach that the industry is moving towards is this data-driven approach. So as we put more and more mini grids out there and we monitor the consumption of the users, we create an archive, this historical database of consumption. So now when we want to do a new mini grid, we can just look for similar mini grids that have been implemented, similar in the sense of the location, the, the type of customer, and so forth. And then we look at that data to inform our, our, um, our load estimates. And this is a way of, of determining the peak, the average daily use, the variability. It's really all there. The problem, of course, is getting access to that data. There's, there's not a lot of data sharing that goes on in the industry. And I think this is a real barrier to, uh, to uh, you know, greater rollouts of, of mini grids. And so basically, this is just a picture of how that works. You look at existing mini grids, you come up with an average uh, per person consumption, and, and you apply that to the future mini grids. So that's a, a, an overview of the, the output energy, how we estimate it, and the characteristics that we're most interested in. And now we're going to go into the input uh, energy. So let's look at that same scenario. Um, and, and now we have a couple of options of how we might supply that. That, uh, that load, we might use wind or solar or, or biomass or something. 
So to know which one to choose, at least from a, an energy standpoint, we need to know how strong the source is. For example, the wind speed or solar. We also want to know how it varies or how consistent it is. And then finally, we want to know how, how its availability changes on the short uh, and the long term. So one way of, of doing this is to use the capacity factor. And the capacity factor is a commonly used metric that lets us, in, in a single number, um, express how a potential energy uh, uh, resource is, is utilized. So it's just the energy that, that's produced, in this case estimated, because we haven't installed our grid yet, divided by the energy that would be produced if that, that generator or that wind turbine were, were producing rated power continuously. So as a quick example here, uh, let's say we have a one kW solar array uh, and we monitor its production over the course of a day and we get 4.8 kilowatt hours. So we, we see the, the power increase uh, in the morning and then decrease in the evening as shown there. Well, the capacity factor then is simply the energy produced divided by the, uh, the rating times 24 hours, because we're looking at a 24 hour period. And we get a capacity factor then of about 0.20 or 20%. So you can imagine if we put the same PV array in an area that has more sun, that our capacity factor would be a greater value. It might be 0.25, for example. So if that's the case, then we can easily compare those two locations, um, the, the energy or the solar resource of those two locations based simply on the, the capacity factor. Another way of thinking of that is if we have a capacity factor of 0.2, as in, as in the previous example, we can replace that uh, PV array with a hypothetical generator rated at 200 watts that operates continuously, at least in theory. I mean, this is just a theoretical um, explanation of a capacity factor. Now, not surprisingly, different resources are going to have different uh, capacity factors. So gen sets, um, they're going to have a high capacity factor because you can more or less run those at rated power continuously, you know, only having to shut them down every so often for maintenance. Uh, PV arrays is going to be lower because the sun is only shining um, for, at, you know, really at most like half a day on average. And, uh, and then even then it's, it's not shining um, uh, fully uh, during the morning and the evening. And so the right column then is just a way of, of comparing those in terms of capacity. So this is the, the size of the, the capacity of the different source to provide um, one, kilowatt, uh, uh, one kilowatt hour per hour for the course of a day. So that you see that you know, a one kW gen set is not equal to a one kW PV array. You need a much larger PV array to supply the same amount of energy as a gen set. In fact, you might need a, a PV array that is between four and seven uh, kilowatts to equal a gen set that's, that's equal to one kilowatt. So the capacity factor then is a, is a useful way of expressing the utilization of a, of a source. Now we're also interested in this variability that our different energy sources are going to have. And the different sources are gonna vary across different time scales. And so when we think about designing our system, we really need to know that variability. If there's a certain time of the year where the wind doesn't blow, we absolutely need to know that if we're going to consider a wind energy conversion system. So we have, a, we have to have a sense of the variability and the variability shows up in, in many different ways uh, for different types of, uh, of resources. So the point here is that we really can't a lot rely on one capacity factor calculation for each resource. We need to rely on several. And, and maybe we look at it across a month or a season or, or even multiple years to get a sense of the true production of that. So then we come up with a, a capacity factor table. We, we calculate the capacity factor for each month or each, each season, and, uh, and that gives us a better picture of the production. So this is an example for a, a wind turbine, and it's gonna be, in this example, it's, it's more windy in, in the spring and the autumn than it is in the, the summer and winter. And so what we're curious or what we're most interested in is the capacity factor uh, of the lowest month. And so in this case, it's January, and it's a capacity factor of 0.14. So here, if we were gonna design our system, we would have to consider January and say, well, if we wanna reliably serve our load in January, we need to look at the capacity factor of 0.14, and that'll tell us how many wind turbines we do need to, 
to install. And I'll talk more about that calculation in the next seminar. So <clears throat> I'll briefly cover the, uh, the different resources and, and how we come up with the data needed to design. For solar, most of the time you can consult a solar map and, uh, and an online database, and you can get an idea of, of the irradiance and insulation. And the irradiance is gonna change throughout the year. It's gonna depend upon several factors like your latitude and your tilt. But the capacity factor is, is nothing more than the, the insulation divided by 24. And the insulation itself is just the area under the irradiance curve. And so typically what we're gonna find is we're gonna find that the insulation is gonna vary between maybe four to seven kilowatt hours per meter squared for Sub-Saharan Africa. And so we're gonna get capacity factors that are somewhere around you know, 0.15 to, to you know, maybe 0.25 depending on the time of year. And there's lots of factors that affect the capacity factor. Here, here's the effect of latitude on a horizontal surface. The closer to the equator you are, the more consistent the generation. The further away, the more variability that, that you see. So Cape Town is going to have very, very low production during their winter and, and high production during the summer. We can balance this out to some extent by tilting our PV uh, array, which is, which is commonly done uh, as, as shown here. This is from uh, Nigeria. Getting into wind, uh, there are wind resource maps available, but most wind resource maps that you'll find are at a hub height for utility scale wind, which is not uh, the hub height for, for small scale. So they might do 50 meters where for small scale, you might be looking at the wind speed just 10 meters above the ground. And in addition, you're not gonna find a wind map that has the, the resolution needed for, um, for small scale uh, wind. Uh, so then you have to rely on measurements and so you have to put up a small MET tower uh, with an anemometer uh, as shown there, and then you measure the speed for one to even two years to really get an idea of the distribution of wind speeds like that shown on the right. Um, there are a, a few ways of filling in the gaps in the data, um, and I'll refer you to, to reference six for more information about how you do that. But once you have an idea of the measured wind speed, you can um, convert it to the power output by looking at the power curve of the wind turbine that you're considering in the middle there, and they're all gonna look a little different, but you just map each wind speed and its, uh, and its uh, probability of occurring through the power curve to come up and you get a distribution then of the power production. And from that, then we can uh, calculate the capacity factor because we have our estimated production now. And you're gonna see that it's gonna vary, of course, across the year. Uh, depending on uh, depending on the wind speed, so if you look at the right there, uh, you get a sense of the capacity factor and how it how it varies. In terms of hydro, we're interested in two pieces of information: the uh, head and and the flow rate. And these are uh, you're going to get wet when you try to measure the the flow rate. There's several different ways of doing it, and I'll uh, refer you to to seven uh, references seven and eight for for more uh, details on how you how you do these uh these measurements. Uh, when we think about the production of, of energy from a hydro resource, what we do is we look at that flow rate, usually in liters per second, and then we will um, reserve some of that for, for the stream. So there's some minimum flow rate in our stream. And, and the table shown on the screen there, we've picked a minimum flow rate of 50. So that leaves you then with the value, which is your maximum micro hydro uh, power flow rate. And from that, you will look at different turbines and their rated flow rate, and you can calculate a capacity factor of each. So in this example, if we decide to, to use a very, very large uh, turbine with a flow rate of 185 liters per second, you know, its capacity factor is going to be really low during those dry months. And, uh, and so it's not gonna be utilized very well there. If you pick a smaller turbine, it's gonna be operated much more consistently, but of course its power output uh, is going to be much lower. So these are, that's really important information then when you, when you think about your hydro system. Do you, do you wanna have it oversized but underutilized or do you wanna have it smaller but utilized uh, to its capacity more frequently? And then finally, we'll, we'll wrap up here with, with biomass. So if you're planning a biomass system, what you really need to know is the energy available in your, your feedstock. Uh, Cause that will tell you uh, the energy input to your, uh, your reactor or your digester and based upon that efficiency, you'll get an idea of the energy that you can put into your uh, genset 
Knowing the genset's efficiency, you can calculate output energy. So there are some databases that are available that, that um, describe a particular region's uh, crops and crop yields. Um, or you can rely on local local surveying. But basically, you look at the crop yield, and if you're, for example, doing a gasification project, it's really the, the residue of the crop that you want. So you can't just use a crop yield. You have to multiply it by a factor, which is the residue to crop ratio. Um, so how much, how much residue do you get for each uh, kilogram of crop? And then to figure out how much of that is available in terms of mass, uh, you look at the, the residue. You multiply it by your uh, estimate of your collection efficiency. If the community is using some of that residue for other sources, you need to subtract that off. And then that gives you the mass of, of residue that you have. So you multiply it by its specific energy to convert it to, to um, megajoules. And then you multiply it by the two efficiencies of the process uh, to get the energy output. And then you can ca calculate the capacity factor as shown there. So to wrap it up here, you know, depending on the source that you are considering, and most often you're going to consider several resources, the data requirements are somewhat different. Um, and you really need to sample more and for a longer time if you expect the underlying resource to change. So it's not good enough to just take an anemometer to measure wind speed and put it up for a day, a week, or a month, because you might have picked a month where it's the most least windy, and, and, and that bias will drastically affect your, your um, design. Uh, similarly with hydro, you don't want to measure the, the flow rate when it's uh, in the rainy season, and you don't want to measure it alone when it's in the dry season. You really need to get a sense of it throughout the course of the year. So um, I've described today then, um, you know, the characteristics of load that we're looking for and uh, uh, attempt to measure it, as well as the energy resources. Now, both of these are really nasty and, and uh, there's a lot of error uh, that can be introduced. But if you're not diligent, if you just make up numbers or, or use, you know, uh, uh, averages, uh, you're probably going to end up with a system that, that uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't perform the way you expect it to. So with that, um, I'll, I'll um, plug for next uh, webinar where we're going to take these input pieces of information and we're going to come up with uh, uh, how to design off-grid systems. So uh, thank you so much for, for uh, listening in. Uh, here is the, the list of references, and uh, I'm happy to take questions. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Henry, for uh giving us a sense of what it means to right size a system. So uh, with that, I, I'd like to open up the floor uh, to questions. Um, we did have one come in already, um, so I'm just going to throw that out here. And that has to do with estimating load percentages of appliances and how you go about that for greatest accuracy, uh, mainly for things like fridges, laundries, ovens, whatever, and whatnot. Yeah, this is challenging. There are a few resources that are out there. Uh, and uh, for, for example, uh, the United States government, uh, they do, I think, I think through uh, the EIA, has uh, information mm -hmm. on the loading percent of different appliances. But I'll warn you that that's, that's the appliances we have in the United States are going to be different than you're probably going to encounter mm -hmm. in the rural areas. So unfortunately, uh, there is not a uh, authoritative source for this particular application. If, if you're a, a researcher listening in, this, this is probably an area where um, we, could, uh, we could all benefit from having a better understanding of that loading percentage. Uh, if you don't, uh, you know, you can always test this. You, you, could, you could purchase the, the appliance yourself and you could do some measurements. Uh, alternatively, what you can do is uh, some manufacturers uh, will provide the the yearly consumption of larger, uh, larger appliances like refrigerators or televisions. And given that information and the power rating, you can calculate the, uh, the loading percentage. But, but those annual consumption uh, values that are given are based on some set of assumptions, like there's a, the appliance is operating in a controlled temperature environment. And that's not going to really be the case in most off-grid users' homes. So, the appliances, the refrigerator might have to work much harder than in the uh, the test case that the manufacturer used. So uh, there's not a, a authoritative research resource that I know that that collects all of this information, 
there's mm-hmm. bits and pieces scattered throughout research um and and uh larger organizations might might um have have lists but uh not necessarily tailored to the off grid situation right and on the note of data resources, you spoke about uh you know the use of um uh, data-driven uh, kind of approaches in order to understand the historical consumption of similar mini grids. Is there are there some um, kind of definitive or uh, trusted resources that you can point us to a database of that information that you'd like to share? Yeah, um, so there are a few few efforts to do this uh, pr- to provide that data. Uh, if if there um, if if you can do a search for the IEEE. Uh, PES Working Group on Sustainable Energy Solutions for Developing uh, Communities. Mm-hmm. There is a, a data. That's, that's really long. I'm sorry. Uh, there <laughs> is a uh, there 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 is a data archive there, uh, and and maybe if it's easier, I can provide a link at the start of the next webinar. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's a good idea. <laughs> so, so so it does it does exist. Uh, it's it, it's small, but uh, I'm actively involved in that group, and we're trying to grow it. So if you if you're listening and you do have data sets of load, um, and uh, and any other relevant data, we'd be happy to to uh, include it and curate it. Uh, more and more, you're seeing re- published research that uh, they're they're providing data sets, um, and uh, and um, you know so you can consult that and, and look. Uh, use use that data, but uh, there's not there's not a definitive um, source. And again, there's, there's probably lots mm-hmm. of data that's scattered around uh, the internet. Uh, I believe MIT had a, a repository that they were building, um, mm-hmm. so they they do exist. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and I think that that's a really great call to action is uh, to recognize the fact that there is uh, a need for a central repository. So the, there's a number of questions that have come in. We're going to try to tackle them all. Just as a reminder, please enter your questions into the Q&A window so we can go ahead and keep track. So one question is regarding the complexity of applying these methods to a hybrid production system. So for example, something that uh, marries solar with wind and hydro, mm-hmm. how would, how would uh, you approach that? Yeah, so in terms of the, the, the resource estimation side, you treat them entirely independently. Um, so if you're going to do a hybrid wind solar, and I, I've done hybrid wind solar, and, and in terms of estimating the resource, um, you, you do them separately. It's when you marry them into a design that, uh, that the correlations between the two of them uh, come into play. We didn't talk about that today. Um, well, I'll talk mm-hmm. about that in the next webinar, but when you have a hybrid, uh, hybrid solution or a hybrid uh, a system that you're going to design, you really need to rely on, on computer simulation to, to really get an idea of how those two sources uh, interact with each other. But I will mm-hmm. say that if you're going to do a hybrid system, you know, to the extent that you can, you want to measure the, um, the uh, you want to take your measurements at, at, at the same time. You don't want to have, uh, you know, hydro flow, water flow measured in September and wind measured in, in July. You know, you'd want to try to have mm-hmm. simultaneous data sets. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and how about the frequency of power synchronization for power from different types of generation, like DC from solar AC from solar hydro, and so forth? Yeah. Okay. Great question. Um, this is we didn't cover that in this. It's uh, in chapter ten of the book. But anytime you you take different AC sources, uh, even of the same type, so even two AC generators, and you want to connect them to the same AC bus, they need to be synchronized. And um, and some generators will be able to do that automatically, and, and some will re- require um, an external control system. So using the example of, of gen sets, which are the most common, uh, common used uh, AC generator, uh, they, will, they, they will often uh, operate on what's called droop control. So as the load increases, the, the frequency that they produce power will decrease and they'll naturally synchronize uh, the frequency. When you connect them in the first place, you do need to make sure that the voltage waveforms are synchronized uh, with each other. And there's usually a, a piece of equipment that will let you, uh, uh, called a synchroscope, that will let you know if, if they are um, in, in sync with each other. But this is something that you absolutely do, do not want to overlook. If you have an inverter and you want to connect it to another inverter or a generator, 
uh, on the same AC bus, that inverter better be capable of synchronizing with, uh, with other uh, AC sources. So this is a, a very critical control, uh, uh, piece of control that you need to have in your system if you plan on doing that. Mm -hmm. And there's a question came, that came in, I think, that is um, actually going to be a good plug for previous webinars. So could you say a bit more about the assessment required to determine cost, effective, cost effectiveness of an off-grid slash mini-grid development versus grid extension? What's the time horizon for such a calculation, and what data is required to incorporate the correct assumption? <laughs> yeah, so this is the topic of the, th the third webinar that we did, uh, which is why yeah. it's a great <laughs> everywhere. Um, yeah, so it, um, the, the, the short answer is that as you get further away from the existing grid, off-grid systems become more attractive, be it a solar home system, be it a mini-grid, um, whatever. As you get closer to the grid, then grid extension makes more sense. Um, to understand which is, which is uh, the preferred method, you need to have a lot of information about the cost of grid extension. Um, you need to know what the cost of the transmission lines are, the distribution lines, uh, the, the cost to per connect each customer. Um, so you need a lot of economic information. And then you need to make some assumptions about the, the, how long that grid extension project is going to last and, and the energy losses along the line and the cost of the energy. And you do a calculation uh, that, that shows you the, the, the cost per kilowatt hour of that grid extension. And then you would compare that to the, the cost uh, per kilowatt hour of your mini grid using something called a levelized cost of, of energy. So that's the, the very short answer to a very complicated question. I get into you know, more details, including an example in the, uh, the third webinar that we, we did in the series. Or maybe it was the second and for webinar. Every for webinar. everybody's benefit, I've gone ahead and added the URL to that webinar mm -hmm. in the chat window. So um, it's appropriately titled uh, Why the Power Grid Isn't Everywhere and the Role of Grid Extension in Electricity Access. So uh, mm -hmm. do take a listen to that recording and it will give you a more in-depth answer to your question. Um, and there's lots of papers so, out there that, that analyze yeah. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so you mentioned for solar energy the diversity factor, or was it the coincidence factor? Is there yeah. a database in which the values for this factor is shown for different situations or cases? <laughs> well, uh, yes. Uh, for uh, for okay, so yes and no. So yes, uh, <laughs> utilities utilities um, in the United States and Europe, uh, Asia. Uh, in parts of Africa, they're going to have uh, that information, and you can find it in, in, in uh, books. I, I actually have that uh, a plot and a reference in my book uh, that you can look it up. But again, that's, that's not for the off-grid context. Um, the plot that I've shown in this webinar is, is an estimate based upon about 200 customers of what that coincidence factor is, and I don't intend that to be authoritative. The difference, though, that we see between the off-grid case and the on-grid, or excuse me, the, the, um, the mini-grid case in, in developing uh, communities versus, you know, my, my neighborhood here in Seattle is that my, um, the, the coincidence factor is, is, is much higher in the off-grid case because most people in that off-grid community, you know, they have the same appliances. They have a couple of lights and a television and a radio, and they're all going to use them at the same time. You know, when they get home, when mm -hmm. the sun set, uh, you know, in, in, in uh, large cities, it's going to be completely different. You know, people, there's much more diversity in when people come home from work or uh, they might be going out and, and you know, uh, at a restaurant and, and so forth. So there's much more diversity in, um, in, in my situation than when I lived in a rural community, for example. Mm -hmm. And Again, another, of, another um, ripe area for research. Yeah, another ripe area absolutely. for research. A lot of exciting opportunities for those of you who are graduate students or even undergrads looking for a senior project. Yeah. I think, Henry, you are just dishing them out today. <laughs> Very exciting. Um, so related to that, uh, in, in, in terms of estimations and so forth, in cases where the primary source of electricity is a diesel generator, can diesel fuel consumption be one indicator to derive the kilowatt hours per day in certain cases, perhaps when compared with load-based data? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I know of at least one operator that did that. So 
uh, maybe they're the one that that's asking the question. Uh, so in this in this strategy, what you do is is and this would only really make sense for a much larger mini grid. Um, you would say, well, I, I don't know what the load is, so I'm going to temporarily install some some uh, generators, and I'm just going to for you know a, a year's worth of time power power my customers with that that generator. Um, and, and during that one year, I'm going to collect data on how they've actually consumed it. And so once I have that data, I'm going to devise a, a solar-powered system or maybe a hybrid system that uh, is based upon that known load profile. And then you move the generators away or you use them for a different purpose. So that is, in fact, another uh, very clever approach uh, to doing it. But, it, you know, it is another level of, of sophistication that's involved in, in arranging that logistically. So it probably only makes sense for a much larger um, mini grid. Mm -hmm. And I think this is going to be our final question. And this question uh, is almost seeking uh, some case studies. But uh, in this instance, um, uh, this uh, listener says, uh, first and foremost, amazing presentation. I couldn't agree more. Does a typical system mm -hmm. intersect between all resources? You mentioned this listener's resident country of Nigeria. What difficulties do you face implementing such systems in Nigeria? Um, so, uh, perhaps uh, some examples relative to Nigeria specifically that you can share if they come to mind? Ah, so, I, I haven't personally done uh, systems in Nigeria. Um, I, there are quite a few uh, operators there uh, that I know of that, that, that have installed it. I mean, uh, as much as we don't like to, to lump the 50-some countries in Africa as just one, you know, one region, uh, I think there are, in fact, a lot of commonalities in the challenges faced in terms of electricity access in rural areas in one country to the next. I mean, I, I, you've run into problems like uh, people's inability to pay. So I talked about mm -hmm. how a surprisingly large amount of, of people connected to mini grids use so little. I mean, 20 or 30, maybe 40 watt hours a day, which, which is so, so little. It's, it's far below what uh, any estimate would, would put their ability to pay. It's, it's far below uh, what, surely what their need is for electricity. And, and it's, uh, it's confounding. I mean, it, it's really challenging to, to figure out what we should do, how should we approach those, those users. Um, that, that's one big challenge. Um, I think as, as we see more and more mini grids that are installed, we'll have a better sense of how to manage that challenge. But then we, we enter new challenges. Um, you know, the, the regulations of mini grids, the subsidies for mini grids, these, these are all things that uh, uh, really need to be resolved. And I don't think any of, any of these um, countries with, with very low electricity access rates have, have it figured out yet. Yeah, lots of work to do. Um, so it's, it's exciting <laughs> sure. times to be in this particular yeah. field. So a last um, item is more of a comment, but you can also certainly uh, answer it as a question. So uh, one listener is curious if you're in touch with any African university, universities to develop this into an organized university course of study. Um, they think that this might be more relevant than, say, merely studying electrical engineering. So uh, <laughs> any thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, this is, this is a course. I teach a course at my university in Seattle uh, on off-grid electrical systems, um, particularly in, in the developing uh, community context. Uh, the book uh, that this webinar and the other ones are based off has been adopted by a few universities. Uh, I know, for example, that uh, Carnegie Mellon has a Rwanda a Kigali campus, and uh, they're going to be using the book there for, uh, for one of their short courses. So um, I'd, I'd love to uh, partner with uh, other universities there. Uh, I do have a lot of content that, that uh, uh, related to the, the material, and uh, I agree. This is you know, African engineers, but also engineers in, in Europe, Asia, the United States, this is all important information. That, I mean, mm -hmm. from a strictly business standpoint, it's, it's, I mean, that's where a lot of growth is going to be. You know, if we want to build uh, um, power plants and transmission lines and heavy infrastructure, you really need to understand the, the context that you're getting into. And, uh, and I think in many universities, we don't, uh, we don't give our students that knowledge. And uh, we are in violent agreement with, with you on that <laughs> point, Henry. And uh, for those of you who are listening, uh, once the series is complete, we do encourage you to use the series as a resource. Do share it uh, 
uh, with your uh, professors, uh, see if they will be interested in integrating it into uh, the curriculum. Uh, because it is uh, one way to uh, get the information now ahead of it, let's say, becoming an official course or short course. So with that, I'd like to echo the sentiments of many of our listeners and say thank you so very much, uh, Henry, for taking the time. As always, we've gone over time, even though we always intend to be short about this, but uh, with nearly 100 <laughs> attendees today, that, that's bound to happen. Um, and I'd like to thank all of you for tuning in listening to us. Uh, don't forget that uh, we have one more uh, installment in this series that's going to happen on March 6th. For those of you who are interested in PDHs, uh, the link is on the screen to be able to get that PDH. And if you have any more questions or anything that we didn't uh, get to cover, do send us an email at webinars at engineeringforchange.org. So with that, I'd like to wish you all a good morning, good evening, or a good afternoon, wherever you may be. I encourage you to become E4C members to get information on the upcoming webinars. And thank you all again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.